You're about to hear Jerry Mander speaking at the UCSC Kresge Town Hall on February 12, 2015. The event was hosted by the Kresge Common Ground Center, Education for a Just and Sustainable World. For more information, visit kresge.ucsc.edu backslash common ground. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was the second rant that I was going to come on before. And then uh, I got ill and couldn't come. And um, I'm ill again now, actually. But uh, I've gotten a lot better in the last uh, uh, week or so, so I decided to kind of, kind of tough it out. But um, That's full blast. Is that louder now? Can I get here? Too loud? Louder. 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 Um, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be here with you, and, and uh, uh, I, I, you should be aware of the fact that my head is very stuffed, my ear, there's no sound in this ear at all, and uh, so I may have to ask you to speak up if you're speaking at some point. So, uh, <clears throat> I want to congratulate you for taking up the kind of subjects you're not taking up in this project. And uh, for wanting to have a session on capitalism. Capitalism, you know, is a kind of uh, third rail of uh, subjects. Uh, uh, people want to talk about new economies, and um, um, they want to speak about how to change everything. But um, it's been my argument for quite a long time that. You're talking about new economy, but you've got to be able to frame it. You have to be able to realize that it's a change from an old economy. You have to understand the framework that you're operating in and the ingredients of the old economy before you can really establish what you're doing, whether this really replaces that and whether you're really covering, covering the bases well enough. Um, in fact, we had a, uh, this book, which is a kind of primer, on capitalism, that's the primer, it tries to cite its inherent qualities, the things that it's made up of, that it can't change. In other words, capitalism can't be changed to be a better system within the frameworks that it operates in. <coughs> and that's the uh, central point of the book. And then at the end of the book, I do talk about uh, frameworks for change, in other words, how to change it. The publisher wanted me to devote only half the book to a discussion of capitalism and then the other half to the frameworks of change, as you do here. But I said, no, you, you, you've got to take the time to focus people on the structure itself, because most people don't really know what the structure is and, and what to do about it. So um, I decided to do a kind of primer, and it started off with a, well, I had the idea to do it. It started off with a conference that we had in San Francisco, IFG organized in 2008. This was just before the system really started going haywire and collapsed and the whole framework of capitalism started shaking. Um, we had 35 economists come to our office in San Francisco, many of them very, very well known, um, from the left and from the right, mostly from the left, but we had some from the right and from the center. We had a few anarchists, we had a few Marxists, we had a lot of, we had a full range. We talked for three days on the subject, uh, is capitalism soon over? And um, after three days, we, we went over the details and identified elements of the system and so on. And we're going to put together a little paper saying uh, basically what our observations were about the problem. And, uh, basically saying capitalism is probably soon over. And then two of the economists, very famous, you probably know their names, I'm not going to repeat them here though, stood up and said, if we're going to name capitalism as the problem, if we're going to talk about capitalism rather than just the system, which is the way most people talk about it, people talk about the system, but they don't name capitalism, then we have to leave we can't sign a document that names capitalism. And we said, what are you talking about? You know, you, you write books which 
a lot of the elements of your books are what we're talking about here. They said, yeah, but you can't use the word capitalism. It will marginalize us if you use capitalism. I said, we we'll marginalize that. <laughs> it's not going to really marginalize us much more. And if we don't name the name, we're not going to be able to move forward because people have got to be able to see what's inside the framework of capitalism and what's not. So um, we never really resolved that, but it made me decide <coughs> that I would go ahead with this book and that at least there'd be one book that names have, there are several now. Uh, Naomi Klein has come out with one recently that does a good job, I think. And, uh, but this was, at the time, the first one from a kind of mainstream, if I can think of myself as mainstream writer, that, um, that it says capitalism, it, was, it may have been an okay system in 1850, or in 1800, or in 1900, when we lived in a different world, when we had abundant resources everywhere, when we had slave labor to do our work for us, um, and when we had completely empty markets so that there were all these people out there waiting to buy things and so on. Maybe that was okay then, <clears throat> but that time is gone. The system is completely obsolete now, and it's collapsing around us, and it's causing tremendous amount of damage. <clears throat> so, as I say, I decided to do a primer, and, it, and, and, I, and I took up seven main points, seven main ingredients of capitalism that are intrinsic to its forms, that you don't have capitalism if you don't have these things. And then flesh them out, and then talk about what we can do about them, ultimately. The first one, of course, is growth, economic growth. Um, on a finite plan. Capitalism has got to grow. That's, that's an essential, that's the whole idea. You put money in, so you make more money. The way you make more money is that more stuff happens, you make more money from that, and you take that money and invest it other money and you make more money. That's why you're a capitalist. That's what you that's what you've got to do. <coughs> so growth is primary, very important. I'll come back to that. The second is amorality. That is to say, you operate only on the principle of expanding money. <coughs> There's no other value. People say, well, we need good capitalism. We need there are examples of capitalists who try to do the right thing. It's not that they're armed. There's also small-scale capitalism, that's to say, your corner grocery or you know the local bowling alley or uh, you know local small business <coughs> where people employ three or four other people and and uh, try to produce enough money to help their families and so on. That's not the capitalism we are talking about. Scale matters, and I'll get into that much more later. Locally owned enterprises <coughs> uh, that operate for families or within communities are not the capital we're talking about. We're talking about abstract capitalism. Capitalism is beyond the community. Uh, the third one, I was the inherent form of corporations, the inherent uh, hierarchy that's built into corporate structure. I'll come back to that later. The fourth is the privatization of democracy. That is to say, it's capitalism that runs the democracy, as we see so clearly now in this country now with the Koch brothers. But it's been that way for quite a while. And, uh, and it operates to privatize commons. Um, it privatizes consciousness. Capitalism creates our brains, thoughts, values, and so on. And I can get into that a little bit later if I have time. It's got a propensity toward war. That is to say, it needs war, really, both as a financial investment and to assure itself of all the resources and so on that are built into the system. And finally, it doesn't make people happy. It's supposed to make you happy. That's why we have it. Everybody, you know, it's supposed to be this happy country. The U.S. is very low on the list of happy countries in the world. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of these things and then uh, move on. Actually, I'm going to read about two pages 
out of the early part of the book um, that leads up to the, to the issue of growth. <coughs> I hope my voice lasts for this whole hour. Um, growth is, a, uh, is an amazing subject uh, because when you think about it, it's what it's, what it's built on is so very important. Day after day, we hear the economy discuss from all sides of the political equation in exactly the same way in the United States and all over the world. Whether it's Obama or Putin or Fox News or NPR or Bill Clinton or John Boehner or Bill Gates or the Koch brothers or Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow or Paul Krugman or Karl Rove or Robert Wright, everybody in the public eye is trying to figure out just one thing, how to revive and sustain rapid economic growth. That's what they're all talking about. That's the goal for everybody. Which is equated with economic recovery and the larger visions of progress. Everyone is grasping for the magic elixir to revive growth. Because without rapid growth, the mega economic system that has functioned in this form for more than a century will collapse. <clears throat> they all agree on that. How to build and sell more new cars. How to have more new housing stores. How to expand energy supplies. How to increase investment in bankruptcy. How to increase exports. Most of all, how to increase shopping. This is the case not only in the United States, but in China, Spain, Chile, Russia, and everywhere else. How to get people to spend more money. How to commodify as much life as possible. How to privatize what remains of natural resources, especially water, forests, open land, biodiversity, public services, social security, Medicare, military, healthcare, prisons, all moving into private hands. Anything that has a chance to produce profits and increase economic growth. <clears throat> We're beginning to run out of those things that they can move into. But there's an important missing link in the discussion. It's ignored by everyone in the mainstream today. Nature. People behave as if our economic system were a self-contained, separate entity residing in its own detached universe, unconnected to realities outside itself, rather than by in a larger system from which it evolved and can't escape. Nature cannot be left out. It's in fact the most important aspect of the entire discussion. Growth is made out of nature, transformed. What we call our economy is rooted largely in the process of transforming elements of the natural world into the tools of human activity and then betting on the rates that we can keep, keep doing it nonstop forever. To leave the source of it is all entirely out of our concerns is short sighted. Well, you could look around this room. Everything in your presence began as something from nature, mined from the ground or harvested. The clothes you're wearing, your shoes, the chair you're sitting in, the book or Kindle you're holding, the bed you sleep in, the car you drive with all its tires, wires, and metals, parts, <coughs> the walls and floor of the room, the carpets, if there were carpets in here, no? Uh, the lights and switches, the electrical lines on the walls, the metals in your kitchen, all ones minerals or materials that were dug up from the earth, then shipped around the world, transformed, reassembled, shipped again to a store, and sold. Or else there were living beings, trees, plants, animals, fibers, corals, that had their own worldly existence, their own roles in living ecological systems. Even so-called chemicals and synthetics began as natural elements, later rearranged. Is your shirt made of polyester? Polyester is plastic. Plastic is oil. Oil used to be trees, plants, dinosaurs, sunlight. <coughs> the whole process of finding, recovering, and transforming these minerals, energies, and beings into commodities that are shipped around the world and get an economic value and bought and sold and wind up in our homes is what we call economics. The kind of economy you have come to depend upon capitalism was until recently highly efficient at delivering transformation 
by using profits from previous transformation to do more of the same. And then wagering in financial markets on which part might grow and which might not. But this can't go on forever. How can it possibly continue? We are running out of resources. Where will the metals and minerals come from to build more cars? Where do we throw away the old ones? How many cars can be built and bought? How many roads can cover the landscape? How many new houses can be built on open land? Where will the food come from when the topsoils are overused and destroyed? And the oceans are dead. How expensive will food become as transport costs continue to zoom? How much carbon can fill the skies? <coughs> we imagined ourselves isolated from the sources of our existence, and we invented instead a myth of endless problems. That's from the Dark Mountain Project. I strongly recommend it. You go online and look for the Dark Mountain Project. It's an English group. It's really great. A new community of scholars, writers, and artists in the United Kingdom. <coughs> the fallout from this imaginative era is all around us. A quarter of the world's mammals are threatened with extinction. An acre and a half of rainforest is filled every second. 75% of the world's fish, fish stocks are on the verge of collapse. Humanity consumes 25% more of the world's natural products than the Earth can replace. So, our society has blurred the most fundamental fact. <coughs> Humans are completely dependent upon the health of the natural world. In fact, we're part of the natural world, made of the same ingredients as the rest of life. Having lost our connection to concrete reality, we really don't grasp the period of the period. We had better do so soon. <coughs> okay, I was going to read a lot more than my voice is. <coughs> I read that first because. Um, that's the mega problem. And it's also the most unsolvable problem. I mean, it's, it's totally unsolvable. If you want capitalism, you want growth. If you want growth, it means transformation of nature and using more and more and more. You can either try to rebuild nature, that's one of the solutions that capitalism proposes, you know, basically. Oh, the sky is going, you know, with climate change, get rid get of that sky, put it out of the new sky, that's called cool. that. <coughs> That's called, what's that called again? Geoengineering. Huh? Geoengineering. Geoengineering. <coughs> That's something in favor. And uh, um, so, that's just, there's a lot more to say about it, but I'm going to move on. The second one I'll talk about briefly is amorality. This morality question is like <coughs> really interesting because of. Um, there's a tendency to think that that capitalism, all that we need is good capitalists, you know, better capitalists. And it's true that if capitalists could adopt other principles, then they could have their business, but then they wouldn't be as profitable. And the whole point they're in that business is to be more profitable. They wouldn't be buying other businesses, and they wouldn't be operating way beyond the community and globally, and forming, reforming the planet's economy into globalized form. <coughs> How many saw so the movie Avatar? Where is it? Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't love that movie. I thought, I thought it was filled with flaws. But there's a couple of scenes in that movie that are absolutely fabulous. And uh, I just want to repeat one of them. That's where the, the business <coughs> that's there's these spaceships going out in space exploring other planets and other moons to find more resources because we're running out of resources on our planet and they want to mine those resources and bring them back to Earth so we can continue. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's too hot. You oh, that's, that's great. Too Thank you so much. <coughs> so they sent out this group of spaceships to explore other planets. And uh, sure enough, they find one. Um, I forget the name of it now. Pandora. Pandora. And uh, there's one problem, though. That there are, there are some Indians living on Pandora mm -hmm. in the very part of the planet that has the resources that we want. Mm -hmm. So the captain of the business on the spaceship who's an officer of the company, <coughs> says to his military, there's some military spaceships going along, go down there, talk to those people, tell them they've got to move to the other side of the planet. 
because we need the resources that are on their side of the planet. Okay, so the military guy goes down there, and then he talks to them, and he calls back, he calls the business guy back up, and he says, <coughs> they say they won't move. They refuse to move. They've been there thousands of years, and they want to stay. That's, they know, that's where they live. <coughs> They're not going to move. What should I do? Should I kill them all? And then the scene that I really thought was really good, and I've never seen in the movie before, was this businessman guy. It goes through a, it goes through a thought process. It's the film slows down, and you watch him thinking about that. What should he do? What should he do? And then he, 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 he articulates, well, the shareholders wouldn't really like it if we killed all those people. But on the other hand, they'd like it even less if their quarterly report was bad. And so, and that would affect my, my, my job. <laughs> so, he called them and says, okay, go ahead, kill them, kill them all. Get them out of the way. And then they start a war down there, and actually, <clears throat> the Indians win, which is quite unusual, but mainly because the white leader of the invading force falls in love with one of the cute Indian women and um, decides to fight with them and brings all his resources in and so on. It's like the white inside is what that's called in the films. And, uh, and so they don't, they don't win the war. But the, but the point is that what he was expressing is something I've called in other books, <clears throat> corporate schizophrenia. In other words, corporations are made up of your neighbors. They are made up of people you know, people you go to church with. Your kids play with their kids. If they come over to your house for dinner, they're great. They're fine. They're wonderful. Their values are good. Blah, blah, blah. But now when they get inside that form, the goal is to, is to advance that process. <laughs> and they make choices that are not the choices they would ordinarily make as normal human beings. This is what's called corporate schizophrenia. In other words, corporations are constantly having to behave like corporations instead of like the people in the corporations. And if the people in the corporations decide not to do that, they, they kick that one out and they strap on another one. To, who, will, who will do that? That's just the way things are. The corporation has got to make growth, it's got to make profits, or it can't exist. So that's, that's amorality. That's living outside moral values. And um, most corporations um, live that way. There are a few who will do some good things because it doesn't violate their other needs. You know, they'll donate money and so on. <coughs> the Koch brothers paid for the New York Parks, you know, the biggest New York Park uh, performance center. It's not that they don't do some good things, but systemically speaking, they are driving uh, a losing, driving a terrible, 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 terrible end. <coughs> Time is flying. Let's see. I just want to say, I'll just say a minute or two about a couple of other things. <coughs> Corporate structure. There's all this talk now about inequity in the system. And just talking about fixing that, you know, balancing equity more. <coughs> but the structure of the capitalist system is a corporate structure. It needs to have a mechanism by which profits move in a certain kind of way. And the people at the top make more money than the people at the bottom, period. The average CEO of a, of a Fortune 500 company makes 650 times more than the average person who works in the office or who works on the assembly line. Now they're trying to lower it so that you'll make only 600 times more. <laughs> they're trying to, you know, but the point is that the structural inequity is, is at every level of the corporation. So the corporation has to constantly operate every one of its levels through a hierarchical form <clears throat> where some benefit 
uh, much more than others, and that's <coughs> they're going to have a very hard time changing that. Believe me, you see all this talk about. And you may you may get a report saying, "Oh, equity, the equity situation in the United States has improved, so that the one percent would formerly own uh, what is it, ninety percent of all economic value now owns only eighty." <laughs> and so, and, and the one percent and the ten percent at the bottom now owns eleven percent, and then this is celebrated, and the people vote on it, and then you know it becomes a big deal. And presidents talk about it; it's a great victory. <coughs> um, I, I think I'll skip war for now. Um, let me talk about quickly an element that's not usually considered in the discussions about capitalism, because it's somehow not intrinsically connected, but it is intrinsically connected. <clears throat> and that is capitalism's need to dominate consciousness, to, to control how we live, how we think, and so on. And how we live, of course, is very important. That's, they're selling us the stuff to feed that way of living and they're creating the imagery that wants us to live a certain kind of way. So, uh, um, this really burst on the scene in, after the Second World War um, with the invention of television. I wrote a book about television. <laughs> it covers a lot of this, but I'll just briefly say that um, since the Second World War, where we had put a lot of effort into producing a military to fight the Second World War, and then after the war we had to find more jobs for the people who came home from the war, and more ways for people to spend money and build a new economy. So there was a, a vast shift over to the goals of a growing economy in the 1950s. And um, a big part of that was an instrument called television. And television was actually invented in the 20s, but it was never used for anything because nobody could see what purpose it had. But then there was a mass switchover to using television as a very dynamic, powerful instrument. <clears throat> to where, over the next 50 years, television basically became the dominant uh, image creator for, for our society. Now, um, in the introduction, he failed to mention that I, before I got into do better work, I was the president of an advertising agency, of a very large, successful advertising agency in San Francisco called Freeman Management Gossip. Some of you probably heard of the Howard Gossip, she was my partner at that time. <coughs> it was in that work that I became horrified at something that, and then this was the 1970s that I became horrified at something that I felt people didn't see or understand. And that's the power of images. You know, when you're doing advertising, what you're essentially doing is you're creating images that go into the brains of everybody who watches. And people think this, that's not important, you know. Oh, it's just an image. <laughs> but Howard Gossage, my partner, used to say, there's a dirty little secret in advertising that once the image goes in, it never comes out. And he used to use a lot of different examples to show that. He used the Jolly Green Giant. Uh, you probably don't remember the Jolly Green Giant. He remembers the Jolly Green Giant. Do you know you had the Jolly Green Giant living in your brain? <laughs> uh, or, uh, or anything, you know, uh, what's the modern, uh, the, the Taco Bell uh, Chihuahua, or uh, Gecko, the Gecko, the Gecko, ge Gecko, the guy from the get-go. <laughs> By saying these things, you get the picture of it immediately, immediately. It's in your brain. And you get a little of the commercial. You get a little bit of the context for that thing. You carry that image. Now, the average American, and this has been true since the 1960s, <coughs> uh, sees 
30,000 commercials a month. 30,000 commercials. The advent of the internet has not lowered that. It's increased that. You still you see the commercials on the internet, curiously, are not as effective as the ones on television because they don't get your full attention the way they do on television. But 30,000 repetitions, not only of the Geico Gecko, but of all kinds of ways of living and ways of being and ways of relating to each other and very, very highly accelerated imagery cut up very, very, very fast in order to move into your brain without any resistance. It just goes in. You don't have to think about it. You don't even have to know that it's in there. It's just in there. And then you go to the store one day or something happens one day and there it is. And you know what it is. And then you are at least willing to contemplate it. That's all they want. They don't expect you to be the one who's going to buy more of it. But if they do it with 200 million people, a lot more people are going to do it than they did. They did. <laughs> now, more than, uh, I think the number that I last looked at was $6 trillion in the last 30 years have been spent on advertising, on commercial, on commercial advertising. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful entry into a, a way of understanding the world, uh, a way of seeing the world, what looks right and what looks wrong, what looks appealing and attractive, and what looks unappealing and, attra and not attractive. And not only that, it's a, it's a training in hyperactivity, television, advertising imagery. Back in the 50s, <coughs> Advertising imagery had uh, an average of 10 edits <coughs> per minute. Now, you can barely look at a commercial that's not... Can, next time, if you're watching television, count the number of what's called technical events. How many times the image changes as you're watching it? Boom, 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 boom. You barely see that beautiful woman walking toward you because you're now on to the car that's coming down the road, and then you're on to somebody cheering about something, and then there's music playing very fast, and it's a super hyperactive uh, set of engagements, and it all goes in. And I think that has also a lot to do with the uh, uh, general speed up and kind of alienation of society. and. Uh, I, don't, I haven't seen really good research on this, but it's my guess that that has a lot to do. So anyway, I won't spend any more time on that, except to point out that <coughs> <coughs> this is what we could call the privatization of consciousness. In other words, the corporatization uh, of, of our brains and our feelings and our values. Now, it's not true about everything. I mean... I could ask five people in this row about their values, and there'd be differences among them. But um, they're operating on a mega scale. They're operating on a scale of moving through the whole system and shaping the whole system. And they can't not do that, because if they didn't advertise their stuff, how much stuff that, that is in the stores in a, in, a, in a Walmart or in a, uh, one of these other giant um, stores, how much stuff of that would be, would be attractive to us? Practically none of it. If we were just living uh, in, a, in a kind of, by a different set of values and experiencing life in another set of ways, then we wouldn't be uh, reacting to it at all. So, uh, they basically created the consciousness of the society. Okay, finally I'll try to end. I'm supposed to take a break soon. This is taking longer than I thought. So, um, this last one, happiness. Um, that's that's a that's an advertisement for the system. In other words, the we have been trained to believe that our society is the most satisfied, exceptional, 
you know, self-approving um, society in the world. And yet, um, all of the research, there's been a lot of research on this point. You've probably seen it all, probably in some of your classes. Um, uh, when, you, when you go to different countries of the world, and you ask the population, are you, are you happy? You ask the people, are they happy? The United States ranks in the lower half of all the countries in the world in those rankings. The ones that rank highest are uh, actually in Scandinavia and certain Central America, Costa Rica, and uh, the Philippines. And uh, what are they? What are they doing in those places? That's different from what we're doing. But the point is that let's see. In the United States, the United States is the highest divorce rate in the world. It has the highest obesity rate in the world. Uh, it has the highest. I think this is lately changed, but the maternal mortality rate in the world, I think now we're second. Uh, we're last among industrial nations uh, on some aspect of the I can't remember what that one was. Childhood poverty, we're second to Mexico. Um, murder, we're second to Russia. Uh, armed robbery, we're first. Uh, Home ownership. The United States is all about home ownership. <laughs> you know, that's all the private house. Uh, we're only 15th in home ownership. I was very surprised by that figure. We're still high, but it's. Uh, you know who's first? Japan. I was very surprised to read that. Uh, wealth inequality, we're number one by a mile. This is a great America. It's the number one wealth inequality country in the world. By a long, by a long shot. Uh, pay differential, number one. The highest and lowest within a context. Um, let's see. Middle class. And estimates of the middle class. <laughs> Where 53rd, Japan, again, is number one. 90% of Japan is middle class. Sweden is 79, Germany is 72. Voter turnout, this is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Voter turnout, this is the great democracy of the world, the exceptional place. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, way below 55% even in presidential elections. It's more like forty percent in all in other um, uh, national elections, and it's about thirty percent in local elections. I think in this last election it was way lower than that. We're um, we're very very low on, on, on that turnout. So the ingredients of capitalism that are, I think, built into the system and that are not enough talked about are the inherent need for growth, the intrinsic aspects of immorality, <clears throat> the inherent inequity of corporate structure, which is the whole system. And again, I'm not talking about the local stores, which should not be called capitalism, because they operate on different sets of values. Family-run stores, community-run stores, things like that. I'm talking about ones that get larger than that, or get owned by people from the outside. Uh, I didn't get into it, but war as an economic strategy, a very important point, in fact. The privatization of democracy and taking over of all election campaigns and so on. The privatization of consciousness. And the fact that um, we're, not, we're not happy. So um, that's what the book discusses, those, those points. And then shifts over to new economy, a new economy discussion. As I said, I didn't even want to get into new economy particularly, because I wanted people to sit with that, with that list and contemplate that structural problem of capitalism. <clears throat> because if you're going to talk about a new economy, 
you're likely to talk about green capitalism. The book goes into why green capitalism is a farce. It, doesn't, it actually doesn't exist. You're allowed to talk about um, uh, better decisions by management. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that go into a lot of discussions of new economies <coughs> that probably are impossible. <coughs> I'll just name quickly the four main subjects, and then we'll take a little break. The four main subjects of, of, that I get into in the book in terms of an alternative way of thinking about that. I just name them, I don't really get into them. The first main point is that nature comes first. All solutions have got to put nature first. If you don't have nature, forget about it. We're going to be done, and we're on the verge of that right now. All decisions have got to have nature as the primary element. Within that discussion, you need to talk about steady state economies, that is to say, economies that do not grow. In fact, that diminish economies that get smaller. How do you do that? How do you make economies smaller and, more, and yet more successful? You've got to talk about contraction and convergence. And by contraction and convergence, I mean the economy gets smaller overall, but the shares of the economy got to be redirected so that within a small economy, the people who have too little will get more of what the people who have too much have. Now, how, do you, how do you get to this? It's a big problem, of course. Bio, biological restoration, extremely important within this movement. <laughs> Rights of nature. This is a new movement. Have you heard about it here? You probably have. Haven't you? Any speeches on that? Rights of nature? This is an emerging movement that I think is very, very important. And it's connected to indigenous, the indigenous rights movement and the values of indigenous people. I've written several books, um, one of which unfortunately I couldn't bring because it's sold out at the moment, but uh, well, in the absence of the center. But studying the, the economic systems of traditional peoples, I'll probably try to get to that more later, but that, there's a lot to learn from indigenous ways of organizing. Okay, that's the first point. The second is the primacy of scale. Leopold Kaur, how many have read Leopold Kaur? Great English writer who wrote, who wrote about scale. Scale is the most important thing. That's why the local store doesn't matter as much as Walmart. You know, it's like a, it's a, other things operate when you're in a lower, very small scale situation that don't operate in most. Um, smallness is, is different from size. Subsidiarity, in economic and in, in political terms, subsidiarity is the, is the process of moving power down to the local. Not having power exists in some faraway institution. <coughs> Money out of politics, things like that. The third is um, if we're going to have corporations, and I think probably we should not. But if we're going to have something called corporations, we can, we can build a new structure for it completely. The book contains 25 specific changes in corporate structure that if you have time there, you will do. A lot of people are getting into co-ops now, you know, the Mondragon experiment and other kinds of experiments, worker-owned uh, co-ops and community-owned businesses uh, where there's good, much greater equality some of these are very large, but the, the people at the top only make three times what the people at the bottom make. Completely different kinds of structure. And the fourth is what I call hybrid economics. <clears throat> you know, we just so quickly dismiss anything that's called socialism, or anarchism, or capitalism, or <coughs> communism, or anything that has any other ism connected to it. And uh, without looking at it, and saying, what, what, what does that thing have to offer? Or indigenous uh, economic forms, how, how they're made up. OK, well, that's all uh, I can do right at the moment. I think, you know, let's take a little short break and uh, come back. Is that all right? Yeah. So I want to just stretch it out. Yeah.
Yeah, so we'll take a little break, catch our breath, and I want to invite you to, over the break, um, connect with somebody from a different generation. You know, look around in this group and see that there may be someone who you believe is of another generation who you can speak with. I also want to invite you to check out the bookstore in the back. There are books for sale for $18 each. And also you can sign up if you're interested for the Common Ground Center email list. We have Bill McKibben coming in two weeks from now and a whole bunch of other speakers. So if you want to stay in the loop, you can sign up back there. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. For the students in the class, I just want to remind you we're going to take attendance at the end of the class at 3.42 or whatever it might be. So please find your, uh, your ACORN clan leader at the end to go ahead and take attendance. And that I'll pass it back to Jerry. You wanted to make a few more comments and then Q&A? Yeah. OK, great. A few more to go. Well, the first thing I want to say was um, that um, I left out one point on, on controlling media that I think is really, really important. And that gives a sense of how, um, how much power is operating. And that is that um, over the last 20 years or so, and definitely right now, these figures have held steady, which is that seven corporations, seven corporations own 75% of global media. And this is not obvious because these corporations are these mega corporations, and, and so you're watching something that sounds like some other media, <coughs> some other company owns it, but they're all part of a larger company. So there are seven giant corporations that own 70%. Of global media. I mean, that's, that's in itself such an amazing, uh, astounding figure that I feel like everybody ought to be a little bit of that. And that's all media. That's radio and television, films, internet, um, magazines, billboards, radio, everything. One by basically seven corporations. So that's it. It's much more extensive than, than, uh, than the other thought. I had the idea to do something, and I, I, I didn't really plan on this, but as I was preparing for this, uh, um, I came upon a document, I came upon an old speech of mine from 1995, um, which on the occasion of the very first teaching, very first anti-globalization teaching, uh, Riverside Church in New York, a very famous place. You know, the WTO had just been basically invented a few years before, and globalization was very rapidly changing its form and increasing its domination globally. And uh, this, and, and everyone was getting ready for the big Doha round of globalization, which was going to be the final takeover of the global economy, <coughs> which we then later did all the organizing for and in Seattle, we organized the big Seattle protests that put, uh, you know, uh, 80,000 people on the streets and uh, the media says 50,000, but I'll tell you it was 80,000 people <coughs> on the streets. And, uh, but the first teaching in that series of teachings was done at Riverside Church, which we did it because that's where Martin Luther King had done his stuff. And, and we didn't know if we'd get much of a crowd at all. It went on for three days, and there was 2,500 people in the room every day, all day, and it, it really, really launched the thing. And um, I found my talk from there. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to read just three pages of it, because it kind of sets the framework of how we began to look at, at globalization, because globalization wasn't even a term before around 1990. People didn't think... But globalization is a great term because it really describes the mega capacities of the machine. So I'll just start from this one spot. The rare descriptions of the global economy that are so far found in media usually come from the advocates and beneficiaries of the process. This hasn't really changed. Transnational corporations and their colleagues in government 
The vision they paint on family are positive. I would say utopian. Economic globalization will be a panacea for everyone. The passage of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the WTO was hailed by the world's political leaders and the transnational corporations almost like a messianic rebirth. They claim it will bring a $250, $250 billion expansion of world economic activity quickly with the benefits trickling down to all of us. The new rising tide will lift all boats. That's the dominant political economy economy. Some, as some aspects of the global economy are starting to new. Surely it's new that the democratic countries of the world have voted to suppress their own democratic laws in order to conform to the rules of the new global corporate bureaucracy in Brussels. Also new is the elimination of regulatory control of global corporate activity and the liberation of money from national control which has led to what uh, John Cordon and Dave Corden have called the casino economy, ruled by currency speculation. That's a very, very big deal. We didn't have time to really talk about it. But the deep ideological principles underlying globalism are not so new. They're the very ideas that brought us to the social environmental impasse of today. Those principles include <coughs> unrestricted corporate access to all resources, labor, consumer markets, massive deregulation and privatization, Primacy of exponential economic growth, increased global free trade to stimulate the growth, deliberate destruction of local self-sufficient third world economies to promote new export economies, and the promotion of global consumerism, new markets, and the uniformity of development everywhere on the planet. Here's the point. All countries, even with cultures as varied as India or Brazil, or Costa Rica or Sweden, must now all join the same global economic model and row their rising boats in union. The net result is already obvious. It's in the breakdown, the private alienation, and the breakdown of the natural world, and a global monoculture. Global homogenization of culture and lifestyle, with the corresponding destruction of local cultures and economies. Soon, every place on earth will look and feel like every place else, with the same restaurants and hotels, the same music, the same clothes, the same malls and superstores, the same streets crowded with the same cars. There'll be scarcely a reason ever to leave home. Wherever you go, it will be the same. It's nearly that way already. That's 1994. It's really that way now. Uh, and the internet has made it even way more so by bringing everybody a whole other level of uni uni unified perception. But can a such a system work? Even on its own terms, will the economic expansion actually happen? If so, how can it sustain itself? Will the resources, the energy, the wood, the minerals, the water come from to feed the growth? Even the accelerated exploitation of the third world's remaining resources, low cost labor and culture, can't go on forever. And where will the effluents be dumped? Who finally vanished from this? Will it be working people in America, at least seen mainly to be losing jobs to machines in corporate flight, and who have been placed in a downward wave competition with co workers in other countries? Will be farmers who, whether in Asia, Africa, or North America, are being shoved off their traditional lands by World Bank export development schemes to make way for giant corporate technology and pesticide intensive farms that no longer provide diverse food for local people? <coughs> or coffee or beef or grain? Uh, I'm almost done with this. For export. Will the urban dwellers now faced with millions of newly landless refugees desperate to find someplace the rare and poorly paid job? And what are the ecological contradictions? Well, I'll get through those. Uh, how could we possibly benefit from a system that destroys the ability of communities and countries to take care of themselves while handing real power to bureaucracies in Geneva, Tokyo, and Brussels? The German environmental philosopher Wolfgang Sachs argued the only thing worse than the failure of the present global development model would be its success. For even at its optimum level, the long-term benefits of the global economy go into a tiny minority of people who sit at the heart of the process, while the rest of humanity is left groping for fewer jobs, increasingly landless and homeless, living in violent societies on a ravaged planet. The only boats that will be lifted, it would seem, are those of the owners and managers of the process. The rest of us will be stuck on the beach, facing the rising tide. One man came up to me, this man here, and pointed out that I left out the role of 
bankers and all this stuff. So we can have a whole other session on that. Maybe he'll read that uh, soon. <coughs> so, <coughs> I named some of the, earlier I named some of the subject areas to be discussed in considering an alternative economic system. <coughs> And I want to point out there's a lot of work going on on alternative economic systems. Um, some of you may have seen Gus Speth's book, uh, or Gar al book. They're both very, very, very good. And uh, Gus Speth, S-P-E-T-H, he's a former uh, Secretary of Labor for Jimmy Carter. And then he quit that and, and became a very radical uh, professor at Yale. And now he's writing books that are very good. And Garl Paradis is one of the big um, thinkers about uh, co-ops, co uh, co-ops. Co 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 There's a lot going on in some ways. What I say in my book is that it's not that hard to imagine what a good society should look like. I mean, you know, if we had a half a day together or a day together, and we started writing on the board what a good society ought to be and what its values ought to be, we, we would succeed in, in, in identifying a very clear set of principles and activity that we know are better, more humane, more ecologically sustainable, uh, more fun, and more, and more uh, 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 capable of lasting over a long period of time in harmony with nature. We can do that. So the problem is really not so much in articulating and naming the subjects. It's like you can see, you can see, we can look across the river, we can see the society over there, we can see what it would, what it would look like. The problem is getting across the river. The problem is getting from here to there. <coughs> but meanwhile, it's very important for us to keep developing the frameworks that we need to know about. Now, Mr. Shaw asked me to read the 10 core principles uh, from this book that once you go into them, have many, millions of sub-principles. And then I'm going to turn it over to him to uh, ask some other questions. The 10 principles in this book that are discussed <coughs> are uh, a new democracy, that is to say, what do we mean by democracy? What is a really engaged democracy? What it's, size, what it's its size and scale, and, um, what does it look like, how, how does it operate, and so on. Um, subsidiarity. This is very important, subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is the process by which power is brought to the local. <coughs> right now, globalization is about bringing power away from the local to the global. The whole structure of globalization is to move power into national corporations and then global corporations and to eliminate the opportunities of local corporations, including all local rulemaking, local standards, local values. And uh, subsidiarity is what, what, it, what is meant by the term is at every stage of the game you bring, you bring it toward, more toward local control. Uh, Ecological sustainability, of course, we know about that. Uh, commodification of heritage and of nature. We have to find a way to decommodify those things. They've only recently been commodified. You know, uh, it wasn't very long ago that the idea of water being a commodity, uh, that, was, that was completely unheard of, it was preposterous. The water should be, or the air, or, or the air would be, or the sky. Or um, uh, in indigenous societies, even land is land. You know, the indigenous societies I work with, the Iroquois in particular, were fabulous and have the most well worked out set of principles on how to organize society. For 500 years, they've, they've had it articulated and written books about it. I recommend Parker on the Iroquois. Well, my book, uh, In the Absence of the Sacred, is a lot of but owning land 
is preposterous. They know nobody owned land among, among most indigenous groups. You could own the house that you were in and the clothes that you were wearing, but you couldn't own the land that your house was on. And the community itself so-called owned the land of, of the tribe, but it wasn't owned by any individual, and it was never used for any profit. It was always used, and it couldn't be sold. For, uh, and so that's another, and, and, and the same applied to most of the common heritage systems. Uh, and encouraging diversity versus encouraging homogenization. This whole society is about homogenizing things so they get all uniform. Uh, let's see. Reestablishing human rights, jobs, livelihood, employment, all these things. The precautionary principle, he, he, he mentioned that earlier. The precautionary principle is a great principle. Um, I, I wrote about it a lot in my technology writings. <laughs> I read a lot of anti-technology books, and one of the principles is the precautionary principle, meaning that you assume something. You don't assume always oh, something is, is uh, innocent until proven guilty. You assume it's guilty until proven innocent. You always find out what the downside of the story is, because once you're into the downside of the story, you can't, you can't really recover from it pretty easily. Uh, precautionary principle is uh, you know, better safe than sorry. And uh, well, those are the points uh, that I think you wanted me to make. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna he wanted he wanted to uh, turn it over to group discussion of some kind. Yeah, one <coughs> couple of questions. I saw you made your hand earlier. You want to share a question? I'm afraid you're going to have to speak up a little bit because my ears are clogged. There are elements in this society that already yeah. have within them the future society. Yeah. When I first came to Santa Cruz, we started the Santa Cruz uh, Credit Union. Uh, there, were, there was a group creating a, an energy plan for the entire county uh, that would uh, look at uh, alternative energy. There, there are cooperatives throughout. There were cooperatives. Now our food co-ops are gone, but there were cooperatives at that time. But the elements are there. They just need to be built on. And the, the teaching in this university should be focused on uh, the ways young people can establish the cooperatives once again. Well, you'll be happy to hear that we have a group of people establishing cooperatives in this class. Yeah. So. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep coming back and again, you know, sign up for the list. And if you want to collaborate, I'll just say a quick word before passing it to you, Marion, that, you know, we have this principle of intergenerational partnership, which is why I was said at the break, please turn to someone from another generation. And it's not just a conceptual thing. I actually deeply believe that that's one of the strategic leverage points for change right now. Hosting many events, you know, in California and, and elsewhere, I find that it's typically the millennial 18 to 34 and the, the baby boomer generation that shows up. And that's perfect. That's great. Um, I love that. And as a social movement theorist and all the research I'm seeing, you know, David Corten's work and uh, Paul Ray with the cultural creatives, that we're actually 30% of adult American population that values equality, the environment, you know, these, these values that, that we share. And so I agree we need to get organized and take action. And I think we're actually a lot larger than we believe we are. We're constantly marginalized because the media is owned by that, you know, maybe 20% or a subset of that 20% that likes to think that we're on the, the fringes, but we're actually quite large. So intergenerational partnerships around issues of common concern are really my, my primary concern here. So we'll pass it to Mary for a question, and Critters, if you can maybe head into the back for one and two. Thank you. Uh, well, David Shaw's collaborative learning class is kind of a unique um, example within a larger framework gleam of hope, if you will, but what I'm concerned about is the university um, 
at large, the university behaves like a corporation. Mm -hmm. um, the University of California in particular um, sustains its growth model off of war and immorality, as you're saying. So my question is, what is your advice to students? Um, does our presence here uh, reinforce the obsolete and fatal flaws of the system from which it exists, and what are all our problems? You know, I, I was thinking that very question as you started to talk, and, and, and just as a follow-up to what I was saying, I was thinking, well, what am I advising everybody here? Yeah. And um, <coughs> the advice is, is, I'm afraid, that uh, to get organized, and uh, just, you have, you'd have to really start a movement within the university. That, that would itself require the, the general awareness that a movement is needed to separate the university from the flaws that it's encouraging to some degree. I mean, this is a great university, you know, there's someone here. This is one of the rare, great outposts. But you could establish a, you know, probably a, a certain amount of organizing, a subgroup, or I don't know what to call it, but a, a, a movement within the university to change the university and um, to not have it be a corporation that operates on the same principles. Right now, of course, it is a corporation. It's got all these buildings. It's got fundraising it has to do. It has salaries it has to pay. It has maintenance. And, you know, it's, and now the University of California wants to increase uh, what students pay to go to it and so on. And, uh, it's a tough organizing project, but it would be great, I think, and I think maybe it fits what your ideas are, to, uh, to create a vision of it, at least. Uh, create what should this university be? What should the rules be? <coughs> How we know what a good society, and we've done a fair amount of homework now, and we know what the ideal good society ought to be. Uh, how do we get from here to there? It's the same problem as we all have on everything, but the university is particularly important because the university starts out with the intention of being, of doing the right thing, whereas General Motors doesn't really start out that way, or Walmart, you know, it's, it's like, you know, they only start out there, they make profit. So there's a major difference between a university and a corporation. You know, University is not required by its inherent logic to to make profit, and it's it, it's a, its requirement is that it uh, educate people, and so you've been educated, and here's what you learn, and that is what you think the university is. I don't know how complicated it would be to try to pull something like that off, but um, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> And I'll, I keep mentioning your colleague, Dylan McKibben. Um, so last year, Common Ground Center at Christ, he became the Right Livelihood College for North America, and Bill McKibben just became the 2014 Right Livelihood Award laureate, along with Edward Snowden and some other great people. And um, he'll be coming via Skype here in two weeks at the same time. And the subject of his talk is fossil fuel divestment to shift the DC investment portfolio which is you know, largely based on fossil fuels for renewables. So divest for fossil fuels and renewables. That's one way, but it's as different than what I'm hearing you. Well, it's a major that's way, but it's that's a, different than what I'm hearing you. Well, it's a major, that's a you know, major, you know, I said that in writing the book, I could, I could sort of look across the river and see what the new society looks like. And that a bunch of you could get together here for a day and create a new society, no problem. I'm sure you would have all, I'm sure you'd have all the, the right uh, features in it. In fact, why don't you do that? <laughs> you know, I, could, I, I would come to that and help out. I'm sure other people would. And Sorry, uh, what? create, a, 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 create a, 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 a mural, a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? a big giant sheet, with all the elements of the society <laughs> articulated and what they should be like and what they should be. It's not that hard. We can do that on, uh, on Tuesday. On what? We can't already do that. We can do that on Tuesday. 
On what? Our, in our class on Tuesday oh, yeah, at the World's Cafe. <laughs> well, it's an exercise course. worth doing in any case, I think, and uh, to get clear on the points because, of, and and um, you know, and from my point of view, I think it's important to um, make sure that you name capitalism as a subject. That's my whole purpose with this book: is that when you're doing alternative stuff, name capitalism and flesh out the qualities of its ingredients that you don't want to have in your new system because otherwise you're sort of talking in the dark. We only have a couple of minutes. This woman back there has been raising her hand for a long time. Oh, is it a man? I can't tell. We've got about 10, 30 questions. Uh. <laughs> well, I just want to remind everybody we have a reception just afterwards, so we'll ask what we can right now and then we'll all turn into pumpkins at 445 and stick around. So, Please. So my question is, um, it's, not, it's kind of a common end question. So we often talk about we, which tends to be... We North talk about what? We, we, which tends to be North America focused primarily, and our system or Europe's, Southern Europe system. But we don't have to reinvent the wheel. As you mentioned, the Scandinavian countries were devastated at the end of World War II. And when they started rebuilding, they rebuilt differently. And I guess, in a sense, they still are somewhat capitalistic, but they have different values that they base their system on, and their people it's a are hybrid, It's a hybrid form, and I think hybrid is a, is a good way of thinking about it. China does some great things, too. There's a section of that uh, book about some of the experiments in China. They do some horrible things, but it's, you know, even the U.S. does some good things. So the question is, how do you pull study. up the good things from each system? Okay, so if we deep, deeply study those systems as to what works well, right. then that would give us yeah. initiative. Yeah. All right, our last comment. Yeah, I think we need to change everything yesterday. Including this format, we need to stop listening to one person, talk endlessly. Overshoot, which is a great book, I recommend everybody read it. It's about how we got to be so late in, do in addressing all these problems. But I love the lecture, but on Friday, we're having uh, the students are putting on a divest from big oil uh, action. Uh, it's about the wedding of big oil and this university, which needs to be stopped yesterday. We need to not develop upper campus. We need to get into environmental, harmo harmonic, you know, harmony designs. They are currently trying to keep us from doing that. And so we need to get real busy real fast, not develop that upper campus in the old fashioned way. So the wedding is on Friday. You can Google wedding uh, divestment big oil. Please, let's start. And let's also start just, you know, let's have more questions, more dialogue, less of li listening to a man usually, one person, lecture to us. I love Bill Kibben, I love these people, but honestly, it's about us, and it's about we, and we really need to break this down and stop doing the same old thing every day. So, you know, I'd like to have a boycott of this university. It's hideous, it's big capital, it's a huge corporation. Like, let's, let's get with this, okay? And stop just listening to other people who already made their money in advertising, like, years after this was started. We, we, this is old. Let's go, okay? Just for the record, I didn't make much money. Friday. Friday. Thank you. Well, <coughs> I will just say in closing that um, I very much agree with the notion that we need to be speaking with each other and so, you know, on our, uh, our talk in two weeks, we have a World Cafe. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, good one minute in and out. Um, so, yeah, more dialogue. We're going to be having a community meal, free dinner for everybody, and, um, and a World Cafe conversation. And these very chairs actually might be the chairs at that wedding that she was just talking about for the divestment day. We're trying to support that. It's at the College Aid Plaza at 12. from at 12 to 12 to 2, College Aid Plaza divestment yeah. wedding.
Okay, do you have any closing words? or? No, just thank you so much. I, I think maybe. she's right, I talk too much. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have that intention, but I, I, uh, I just sort of got carried, carried away, and I'm a little bit fuzzy-headed, frankly, right at the moment. But, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.